so great to be in this room and to look around and see so many um, people who have made working on HIV and women their passion for the last several decades, and we're still here, so um, we'll carry on. So my task in 15 minutes is to summarize comorbidities, uh, a really large topic, and what we've learned. So I'm gonna try to take the 30,000 foot view here. Um, talk about epidemiology a little bit. I think the really exciting work that's been done to understand some of the sex differences in pathogenesis that may underlie the excess risk of comorbidities and the clinical implications. Um, this is a slide from Peter Rice that's probably 10 years old now that highlights the spectrum of comorbidities and non-AIDS complications that we've seen at increased rates with people living with HIV. And some of these are further augmented for women. And I assure you that the tissues and cells and organs on this slide are from women. <laughs> um, I think as we think about complications, we need to think about how this changes over the life course. Um, we've sort of glommed it all together, but there may be unique uh, contributions of specific issues at different stages during the, the lifespan. And there also may be consequences of things that happen early, like bone loss in pregnancy that could set the stage for bone loss later in life. And Risa Hoffman um, made a version of the slide that kind of summarizes the differences in the types of complications that we might see. Now, some of you might be thinking, she's talking about complications, and nowhere on these slides is cervical cancer mentioned. And so I want to just say at the, up, you know, at the outset that that's a very important comorbidity for women living with HIV. At increased ra rates doesn't completely reverse with antiretroviral therapy, but I'm focusing here on some of the non-infectious complications. Um, and we've heard and seen this interaction between chronic inflammation, antiretroviral therapy, and other co-infections as they uh, help to contribute to this, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So the number of comorbid, comorbid conditions in people living with HIV is clearly on the rise. Um, there's nothing like putting together a slide and then opening your computer to see that in this week's CID, the WISE cohort has presented a really nice compilation of all of the, the rates of uh, comorbidities, non-AIDS events in women living with HIV compared to those without um, that really highlights the individual risks of different diseases, and I refer you to that presentation. I'll talk about a few of the, the key areas that, that um, that I want to focus on where we've made, I think, some progress and where we hope to see more coming soon. So if we think about in the general population, and this is U.S. data, um, what are the leading causes of death for women? Um, coronary heart disease and stroke lead the way, and, and so it's no surprise that these will also be important comorbidities for women living with HIV. These are followed by lung and breast cancer. Um, in, in terms of cardiovascular disease, trends in mortality due to this over the last um, period of time, you know, the rates are continuing to go up. And this slide is divided by um, men, HIV, and, uh, women with HIV on the left and men on the right, and it shows the proportionate mortality over time. And you can see that for black women and white women and Hispanic women and in white or blue, red, and green, these rates are on the rise. Um, you can also see in men that increase seems to be a little bit more um, accelerated uh, among the women. Um, and this is at a time where in the general population, trends in mortality due to cardiovascular disease are on the decline, and even among uh, other inflammatory, people living with other inflammatory conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and so this, I think, is going to continue to be an issue moving into the future. And, and I think cardiovascular disease is one area where we have data from research that suggests that the relative impact of HIV on augmenting the risk of disease is, is heightened in women compared to men. So this was a study looking at um, carotid intimamedial thickness and looking at the effects of HIV and smoking on uh, carotid thickness, and 
at the bottom. And it shows that for women, the, um, the excess risk was 0.2. For men, it was 0.128. And it was similar to the effects of smoking. Um, also, I'm not going to try to go back. That sounds really dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> okay, My, myocardial hospitalization rates have also been higher for women, and there's been a higher association in those studies as well. Um, data from the AIDS clinical trials group um, longitudinal follow-up cohort suggested that rates of stroke in women living with HIV were also higher uh, than men in this group. Uh, and the factors that were associated with stroke were, not surprisingly, older age and higher LDL cholesterol, having hypertension, but also having a CD4 count of less than 200 and an HIV RNA of greater than 200. Interestingly, being an injection drug user, uh, having hepatitis C co-infection, or any particular antiretroviral therapy did not seem to have an independent effect. Um, other studies have shown, similarly, that rates for stroke are higher in women living with HIV compared to HIV-negative uh, women. So this is an important comorbidity, and particularly in resource-limited settings. Um, and no surprise that bone disease and fracture prevalence is high in women living with HIV. In, in some studies, the rates between women and men have not been different due to higher rates of uh, low bone density among MSM in some trials, but this is a really important uh, comorbidity for which long-term strategies for prevention and treatment have not been um, fully assessed. And then Sharon mentioned, so I won't review in great detail, how important the data from the advanced study were in helping us understand, um, at least in the population of women in South Africa, uh, the higher rates of, of weight gain for women. As noted in this trial, had about 60 percent women, and that the um, body weight change over 48 weeks uh, was a, higher for women in, in the Report in the New England Journal, 6.4 kilograms uh, for women compared to 4.7 for men on the Taft Allutegravir arm. Um, also in the presentation, it was out to 96 weeks, it was actually 10 kilograms. Now other cohorts uh, in, the, in North America, U.S. and Europe have seen a sex difference in weight gain on integrase inhibitors, higher for, uh, for blacks, for women. For those with a lower CD4 and a higher viral load at the time that treatment was started. So I, I think those studies have suggested that, that there may be some interaction with disease and um, improvement in um, responding to treatment, but I think there's nothing like a randomized trial to really help us be able to see that there's clearly an interaction here between sex, treatment, and weight gain. Um, as the dolutegravir rollout spreads across Africa, and we'll have data from other settings to be able to see whether this is uh, um, more of an issue among certain subgroups of women, and then what the consequences are in terms of the long-term effects. Uh, in, you know, in the studies that were, have been done, cholesterol increases, blood glucose changes have not been that evident, but the follow-up has been relatively short, and if you see sustained weight gain over longer periods of time, the consequences of this uh, could be quite significant. So why, why are we seeing some of these differences? And I think this is a really important um, advance that's happened in research in an area where we need more work. I think. You know, if we, if we reflect for a second, life expectancy in the U.S. and looking at it by sex and ethnicity, women live longer than men, white women, black women, uh, compared to men. This was data, it's still, it's a little bit out of date, but women generally have longer longevity than men. So the question is, is this survival advantage somehow um, miti mitigated if, if you're for women living with HIV? And if so, what's driving that? Um, and I think that a key area of research has been understanding that women have a uniquely robust innate immune response to HIV compared to men early in disease. After exposure to the virus, um, the production of interferon and interferon sensitive gene expression is higher in women than it is in men. And that actually is part of the reason why viral load may be lower early in disease in women compared to men. And so there are some beneficial effects of the initial control of the virus, but it may be that un 
you know, this goes on untamed, it'll have long-term consequences in terms of excess immune activation and inflammation. Um, so these are four bars that you can't read the, uh, for some reason it's black on this version of the slide, but basically the red are women living with HIV and the pink are women um, without HIV, the dark blue are men living with HIV, and the light blue without. And you can see that levels of soluble CD163 and soluble CD14, both markers of monocyte um, um, and immune activation, are higher for the women than they are for the men. Now also, as Sharon alluded to earlier, um, what are the consequences of reproductive aging for women, and how might that contribute to some of this excess risk? Um, so there's a, a hormone, anti-mullerian hormone, which can be measured, which is a good indicator of, um, of, of menopause. It's produced by ovarian granulosa cells, and levels drop to an undetectable uh, measure a few years prior to menopause. So you don't have to just ask women, are you still having menstrual cycle? You can actually do a biomarker. And this is um, helpful in really looking at ovarian reserves. So the lower levels reflect um, that, that uh, e reproductive aging. Um, and this tends to be consistent throughout the, the menstrual cycle. So a, a really important study from the WISE cohort looking at women with HIV compared to those who are HIV negative showed this drop off in the levels of this hormone at an earlier point in women with HIV. Now, um, which suggests lower estrogen, um, decreased ovarian reserve, and possibly increased cardiovascular risk. So they took this a, a step further and looked at uh, the relationship between this hormone, detectable or undetectable, uh, and uh, uh, measures of atherosclerotic plaque and found that, that subclinical atherosclerotic plaque increased across the aging spectrum. So it may be that uh, sort of accelerated reproductive aging may underlie some of this excess. And they've also shown some increases in, with the drop in the AMH levels, increases in some of these markers of inflammation as well. Now, I think a really um, neglected area of research about comorbidities has been looking beyond the biomedical um, uh, biomarker, uh, other traditional risk factors. And um, three studies I want to highlight, one showing that food insecurity was associated with higher levels of IL-6, an inflammatory biomarker, and tumor necrosis factor, independent of HIV RNA. Emotional stress in a study by Ahmed Takawal, who studies arterial markers of arterial inflammation, was associated with higher levels of inflammation. And then also studies showing that depression is associated with higher levels of these same biomarkers that we've linked to many of these non-infectious complications. And most of our research that's been done that's looked at risk factors and, and why are women having maybe higher events have really not been measuring these things in a, in a uh, reproducible way. And I think that is an area for much more uh, focus in the future. And we also know that traditional risk factors occur um, frequently and are, import, are important to measure um, and may be contributing as well. Um, women living with HIV uh, in several studies have been shown to be less likely to be offered medications targeting cardiovascular risk factors. Um, the next sl slide from the DAD study from several years ago actually showing that um, the relative rate of receipt of interventions for women compared to men, um, so the light, the light one is unadjusted and the dark little markers are adjusted, but showing that lipid lowering, um, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, antihypertensives, and invasive cardiac procedures were less likely to be offered to women than they were to men. Um, and so in terms of where we're going in the future, where we may soon learn more, the REPRIEVE trial, which is the first large-scale randomized trial to test an intervention of uh, statins for people living with HIV, does have built into it, um, a, led by Marcala Zani and Sarah Lobi, 
a study to look at sex-specific mechanisms of cardiovascular disease and reduction in HIV. And it will look at, the study has 30% women enrolled, 7,500 people around the world, um, and looking at sex-based differences in statin-induced immunomodulation, as well as how, immuno, how immune activation un, may underlie this cardiovascular risk. Um, we'll also be looking at whether um, measures of anti-mullerian hormone influence immune activation and cardiovascular risk. So being able to embed this important study into this large trial, I think, shows that we are making some progress in, in uh, getting these issues on the, on the radar. So what can we do now? I think, you know, as we have always been saying, make healthy living the focus. Um, tr treat HIV, identify and treat, but as Sharon indicated, what is the optimal treatment I think deserves more attention. Smoking cessation is probably one of the most important things that we can do in the clinical setting. And then I think integrating screening and prevention interventions for depression, um, uh, other um, comorbidities into practice everywhere globally is, is important. Um, and attention and support for interventions to address and help people understand how to incorporate changes in their diet, exercise, stress management, mindfulness in both community and clinical settings. Um, and so in conclusion, um, I think it's very clear that comorbidities are here to stay, and as the population living with HIV ages, this will not go away. Um, these robust immune responses that we have may have uh, unintended consequences, but I think there are things that we can do to mitigate them, and we need research to continue to identify these uh, interventions to both prevent uh, and treat these comorbidities, including the structural, environmental, and behavioral factors that conspire with the biologic to lead to uh, disease. So I just want to thank a couple people who gave me slides, and um, thank you for your attention. Thank you.